this morning, we're jumping back in to John chapter 16. And we've been in John 16 for quite a while. If, uh, if you're new, um, we are walking through the book of John and just trying to go verse by verse and, and to share. It's such an, uh, an incredible book written by Jesus' best friend. And this particular, this particular passage that we've been in uh, for, the last, for the last about four or five weeks, talking about what's happened between the upper room and what's going to happen in the garden, uh, is, it's so powerful, impactful. Uh, we learn things here that we don't find anywhere else in Scripture, and, and, and it gives us insight into these last teachings, these last words of Jesus before he is literally uh, arrested and then um, he is crucified that next day. And so, so these things are important. Learning what Jesus' last words, what he's trying to get across and communicate. Today we're going to talk a little bit about being disoriented. The disciples were somewhat disoriented. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been disoriented? Maybe, it, maybe you were at a theme park and you got off the roller coaster. Maybe it was at a, you know, the county fair or a carnival and you get, you get off the till the world or something like that and you just a little bit woozy and you feel like you're going to throw up or you're just disoriented from that from that experience. I thought of this. When, when I was youth pastor and in youth camps, probably before that, we would run these relay races and have different teams and we'd run re relay races and what part of the relay would always be where you take a baseball bat and you put your forehead on it. Anybody ever done this? You put your forehead on it and you spin around and around and around and around, and you go around about 10 times, and then you're supposed to run down to tag the other person, and you look, and you, you just think in your mind, I'm running straight, but you're not running straight. You're running sideways, and you fall, and it's, don't, listen, if you're older, don't try that at home, because it can be a little bit dangerous. When I was in high school, playing football, I got, I got this story ended on, on a couple of occasions real good, but I'll just share one of them with you. I, I, was, the, I was the backup punter. I, I, I started quarterback and I played defensive back. Uh, I kicked extra points. Sometimes I kicked off, but I was the backup punter. And, and when we ran a fake punt, they always put me back to do the, run a fake punt. And I, we were practicing, and man, I got hit. And it wasn't a hit, but it was more of a sling, and my head hit hard against the turf, and, and it disoriented me quite severely at that moment. And, and so I continued on in, in practice, and we'd go, go, start to go through some plays and scrimmage, and coach would call a play in the huddle, and we'd break, and we'd come to the line. And I'd get to the line, and I'd think, and I'd say, what was the play? And we'd go back and we'd huddle up again. Coach would say again, I'd get up to the line and I, I said, what's the play? And co Coach did it the second time he did it. The third time I did that, he said, okay, Freddie, you got to quit messing around. We got to get on with this. Well, when he said that, I just lost it. I, I, I didn't know really who my, my coaches were. The only person I knew was my best friend, Gary Saffer, I knew my car was green. That old Ford Mercury green had a green Mercury Montego and I had cherry bombs on it, an eight track, four speakers in the back, and shag carpet. It was just the coolest car. White letter, white letter tires on it. Chrome breather. I knew my car was green and I knew that it was Wednesday. And Wednesdays, I had to go to church. My dad had drilled that into me. Get home, we're going to church. Get home, we're going to church. And so those were, that was really all I knew. I was pretty disoriented for quite a while that, that, that evening. And they took me to, to the 
one hospital and they transferred me, transfer me to another hospital. And, and uh, when I got home, I called my coach, said, hey, coach. He goes, you okay? I said, man, I'm great. Well, on that day, you know, obviously I had a concussion. That was on a Wednesday, and uh, I was deep for the kickoff on Friday night. There was no setting that back. Um, so pray for me for my future years. Will you do that? But talk about being dis- disoriented. I think of this, a storm, a tornado came through in Joppa, Missouri. My dad had just died a few days before I'd preached his funeral. And uh, man, we, we heard the tornado had hit. And it was going off. We were at church that night. I was speaking for my dad. I'd preach her that morning, that did his funeral the day before, and then was speaking. And uh, me and my, some of my buddies I grew up with that were at church there, we head for Joplin, get in on the back roads. And I wanted to get to the hospital for some reason where my dad had been. And a buddy of mine, his son had been killed in a motorcycle accident just a couple of months before. And, and, and the church he was youth pastor at was close by. Somehow we just wanted to get there. When we got there, you know, the hospital is, every window's broke out. Cars are just literally stacked on top of each other. You, you wonder, how did it do that? But the entire neighborhood around the hospital was gone. When I say gone, there wasn't a street sign. There wasn't a stick sticking up, a tree. It was just flattened and debris everywhere. And, and, and so... There was this being disoriented. We know it's right up here. That church is right up here, but there was no sign. There was no tree. There was no house that you remember. You go there and you turn right. Totally disoriented. To be disoriented is to, is to lose one's way or to lose a sense of direction. It's not being able to think clearly. It's to be confused. And many times that's because of the removal of something that serves to guide you. The disciples were disoriented at this juncture. The things that Jesus has been teaching. Now, he had taught earlier how he was going to destroy the temple in three days, build it up. He had taught earlier concerning his his crucifixion. But they they weren't getting this. They weren't grasping it. Now, things are getting a little more intense. Jesus shared what we know as that Last Supper. One of their best friends has denied. You know, they they apparently were pretty close, but they didn't have a whole lot of discernment when it came to Judas because they were were rocked by the fact Judas was identified as the the betrayer. Their life was was out of control in a sense. You know, we go go through seasons of being disoriented. Sometimes being disoriented comes because of of grief or lack of grief. Some call it a complicated grief. Some people never really deal with with their grief. It's an unresolved grief. And it's, it's like, it's like it's hard to get their bearings. It's hard to get back on, on track. Sometimes we are disoriented because of, of sorrow. Our heart, our hearts are just heavy. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a sadness. And of course, that sadness can come about from a lot of, of different reasons. I, I'll tell you one thing is, is conflict. When there's conflict or when we feel misunderstood or mis, mistreated, there's really a sadness that comes to our heart and, and, and we can feel like, what's happening in my world? The things that I used to think and the people I used to think were friends and, and now we're, we're disoriented. Suffering, suffering can cause us to be disoriented. Sometimes we suffer because of, of health issues. We're not able to do things we used to do. Uh, we recognize how vulnerable our, our life really is. Maybe it's a physical ailment. Sometimes it's an emotional 
an emotional um, suffering that takes place. Now, suffering, conflict, grief, all those things can, can cause us to be disordered. And then there's others. And I recognize, you know, we've been talking a lot about, about how to live, how to act, how to handle situations, living right, righteous, his righteousness. We've been walking through all these things, and this, Jesus takes a turn here. And, and I marvel, I marvel at all these different emphasis that he, that he speaks on, but he speaks to this idea of being disoriented. I think he did it because he recognized this was only the beginning. The disciples were really going to go through a very disorienting, difficult, doubtful time. He was just trying to prepare them for what lied ahead. And I think this morning, there's folks here today, there's things that have happened emotionally, physically, there's things that have happened relationally. There's loss, grief, suffering, conflict, all these things. And, and I feel with, with all my heart, God wants to speak something so clear and alive to some hearts and lives here. But I also believe he wants to prepare us. Just like, just like he knew the disciples were going to face so much he knows we're going to face much. So he's concerned about each one of you and what you are going through and the questions and, the, and, and just kind of the, you've been rocked and it's just kind of like, I got to find some footing here. I don't, I don't understand. We feel like we're, we can be attacked, whether that by people or whether that by the enemy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then, of course, we understand the world in which we live. And I believe the Lord's preparing us. I believe he's, going to, he's giving us these words to help us to have firm, a firm foundation. Because we live, in a, we live in a very complicated world. And there are many who believe that in, regardless of who wins the upcoming election, that after the, elect, the election, America will see social disobedience like it's, like it's never seen before. That it will make the 60s and early 70s look tame. And when I read that, I thought, well, the good news is this. It may, it, it may get crazy in our world, crazier in our world. But I, I think back in of the late 60s and early 70s and being a teenager and and understanding what was happening in the world somewhat. And also understanding that at the same time that chaos and all the disorienting, the, re, the rebellion and, and the protests and everything that was happening as a result of the Vietnam War, that in the midst of that, there was also this thing called the Jesus Movement. And at the same time, there were 600,000 people in Southern California, 600,000 hippies that got saved. How about that? And who knows how in the midst of all this craziness, see, because the Bible says that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. When it's the darkest, that's when Jesus shines the brightest. This is still the greatest time in all of the history of the world for the church. Amen? Amen. Yeah, you know, there's this dis disoriented. We talk about what's happening, the, the, the social, political distress, but the, the residual effect of COVID. And uh, I understand it's a real thing. But I also understand that, that it's also been politicized. And it, and it promotes so much fear. And I thank God for our online. Amen? Do you know that because of online and people coming back, that we're reaching more people today 
in, in this church, our church is bigger and stronger than it's ever been in spite of COVID and in spite of what, the way we sense the enemies tried to undermine the church. Isn't that awesome? I love it. Let me say this. If you're in a, a high risk, if you're uh, concerned, thank God we have online. So I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't protect and be cautious and all those things. But here's what's happened is it's become a, a political thing. It's become a, a, a f- just hammered with fear. It's affected the church. There are consultants and experts in church life and church growth that talk about the fact that 30% of people who are not in church, who used to be in church, there's 30% of people who may never come back to church. We're not talking about people that watch online. We're talking about people that just kind of, see, while a lot of people has have allowed this season to launch them closer to Jesus. And that's what's happened here at the Island Church. So many people are going for God in this time. But at the same time, there are some who've used it as an excuse to withdraw or to isolate. And I will tell you, that's always dangerous. When you isolate yourself, and I'm not talking about being responsible and and guarding your life. I'm talking about a really abandoning, about purposefully distancing yourself. Here's what happens. When you are left to your own mind, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. We need a spirit-controlled mind. We need a spirit-filled mind. Amen? These are complicated days. We've talked about, we talked about it last week. We need the Holy Spirit moving in our life. So, God gives us these words, and, and I, believe they're, I believe they're relevant. They're 21st century. They're right where we live personally. They're where we live in light, in light of the world. And again, I don't mean to be redundant. This is the last message on this, but I want you to, want you to, to grab a hold of these things. He's talked about peace. Boy, we need peace. My peace I leave, not as a world, But we're talking about a peace that passes all understanding, guards our heart and minds. He's talked to his disciple about being these fruitful followers that you're to be so connected to Jesus that regardless of what's going around, you just you just display you love because you're so in love and so connected to God that love is displayed, that joy is displayed, that peace. Why? Because you're connected. Fruitful followers have joy. He talked about love. Greater love hath no man than this, lay down his life. I'm going to lay down my life. And you're my friends. You're my friends. I'm not talking about religion, guys. I'm not looking, calling you servants. I'm calling you my friends. And then he told them this. He said, and listen, the world is going to hate you. You know why? Because it hated me. Because it hated me, it's going to hate you. So don't be surprised. And then, of course, he talked about the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we dealt with that, dealt with that last week. So don't be surprised. Let me say this. Let me, let me just declare this one more time. I want you to have an understanding. The world hates us. They hate Jesus. They hate the Bible. They hate us, the world, the world system, a humanistic value. I'm not just talking about people. I'm talking about the culture, the world. Hates us because we do believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Because we do believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Because we do believe that life starts at conception We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe in the sanctity of marriage, that marriage is for a man and a woman, that there are two genders, male and female, and that God created male and female, and and for this purpose a man shall, shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. Because we believe that there's no way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. 
See, that's not, that's not something that I made up. It's not something that the church made up. This is what the Bible teaches us. So as Christ followers, this is foundational in our life. So with, with all that in mind, here's these, these last statements. I'm not, not going to preach long this morning. Amen? You don't believe it. But watch this. Here's what Jesus says to them before, before all hell breaks loose. He tells them, and I, I love this. He says, listen, we, uh, we're going to see, we're going to see sorrow turn into joy. Sorrow will turn to joy. I love it. Amen. That's what God does. He turns our sorrow into a joy. The disciples facing all these things, troubling. They're, they're, there's a confusion. They're disoriented. And he, and he says things like this to them. And this is a little wordy. And I'm going to read this first part, and then we'll just kind of kind of describe the remaining when we get to it. But here's what he says. A little while, everybody say a little while. A little while, you will see me no longer. In a little while, you will see me. So some of his disciples said to, to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father... So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? Why do we not know what he is talking about? Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me in a little while you will see me. Truly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Somebody say amen. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask in the fa- uh, ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name, but ask, and you will receive that your joy will be full. He's preparing them for the times to come. He's he's setting this up, and he's helping them to to understand that they're going to face some very difficult days. You got to remember, they had no idea what was about to happen to Jesus. Now, Jesus had taught them, but they didn't grasp it. So, so, So even... Even though he'd shared it, there's, and, and maybe over here they're beginning to process it, but, but they're still not grasping it because they hadn't read. We had the benefit of reading and of knowing that he was going to be crucified. He was going to die for our sins, but then he was going to be resurrected from the dead. So not knowing this, Their hearts are heavy. They're disoriented by everything. They're filled with a sense of doubt. And then he says, but guys, listen, it's it's just going to be a little while. A little while. You're not going to see me. But in a little while, you're going to see me. And they're going, what is this little while stuff? Well, let's call it the principle of a little while. And it's something we need to learn to hang on to in a little while. Let's say it again, in a little while. Most of the time, sometimes God just moves instantly. But so many times he 
It's a process in between that moment when we have a word from God, when we believe God's heard us, we're, we're exercising our faith, and then until that moment till we see the answer fulfilled. There's that in-between time in a little while. In a little while. It's going to be rough. There's going to be a fight. Living for Jesus, listen, I'm not going to tell you living for Jesus is easy, but I'm not going to tell you that living for, for Jesus is hard. The Bible never says that. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Now, it's going to take courage and guts and faith, but the reason I, I say it's not hard is because our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is in God. But when you are in the midst, when you are facing that difficulty and you're disoriented, and you're wondering, where is God at? And why is this happening? And why are these people saying this or attacking me? And why is the bottom falling out? And, and, and what's going on in the world? Don't give up. Don't allow the confusion, being disoriented. Don't allow the, re the world to become a reflection in you. In a little while... You're going to get a breakthrough. In a little while, joy is going to come. See, what we struggle with is when our little, be little while feels like a long a while. When little while turns to long while, we struggle with that. But see, that's where faith, God loves you. He loved these guys. He was preparing them. He was trying to help them, explain to them. You need all these things. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Now, guys, it's going to get rough. There's going to be times in life. Does everybody here understand it rains on the just and the unjust? Does everyone understand life, life's not fair? Life has a way of being cruel. And just because we know the Lord, we're not immune. The kids will tell you one of my favorite sayings to them. Well, I told them all the time. Dad, I don't feel like going to school. Hey, hop up, get up. Life's hard. Then you die. Get in the car. We're going to school. Dad, I don't feel like going to church. Hey, I'm the pastor. I don't either. Get in the car. We're going to church. Life's hard. Then you die. That seems harsh. But the reality is this, is his life can be so hard. It took a long time in my life before I faced, I, I, I feel like I lived a, almost a fantasy life for a long time before I faced some of the most harshest, difficult, intense oppo people opposing me, before I experienced some of the things in life that just rattled me. And I can remember praying. I remember a time laying in my closet praying, God, help me through this. Help me through this, God. I don't know what to do. Crying out to God. And I didn't understand it like I do today. But what he was trying to get across to me is hang on in a little while. In a little while. Your, your sorrow your sorrow is going to be turned to joy. Don't stop trusting me. Are you following me here? Amen? He really wants to get this point across. He really wants to get it across strong. So he, he tells them an illustration. It's a practical illustration that they would understand in their life. They also knew it from Scripture because they studied the book of Isaiah, what we know is the book of Isaiah. And, and, and in Isaiah 66, 7 to 14, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's kind of interesting how, how Isaiah words this. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Who's heard of such a thing? That's not the progression of how it goes. Here's what Jesus tells them in John 16 and 21. When a woman is giving birth... She has sorrow, 
because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought into the world. They understood labor, the travail. The Bible uses, even uses the word here, sorrow. The sorrow that was going to be, that was going to be happening. That the, in the pain of labor, that there was, there was going to be in a little while, there was going to be the crying of this baby, and all of a sudden, the anguish is going to turn into joy. Joy. I remember, I remember, I remember vividly when our kids were born, and, and, and Liz had relatively fast labors. I think we went to hospital at six in the morning, and Luke was born at, at noon. He was born on May, May the 18th, 1986, and it was Pentecost Sunday. I remember it clearly. I'd planned this. I'd thought about this. I don't know why, but it was in my mind. Men, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. And when it happens, I get to drive fast to the hospital. And if I get stopped, sir, please give me an escort. My wife is having a baby. And Liz was like, slow down, Fred. Slow down, Fred. Slow down, Fred. It was a hard labor. When that baby was born, oh my goodness, baby boy, we didn't know what we were having. Man, I'm calling everybody. Whew. We had, listen, Liz weighed about 100 pounds. Luke weighed nine pounds. He was a big baby boy. I said, we had a nine pound baby boy. Oh, it's awesome. We got a baby boy. We got a baby boy. Oh, she's doing great. She's doing great. It was so easy. She's doing great. And I remember one of the calls I hung up and Fred, and, and she said, Fred, let me tell you one thing. I just want you to know this. It hurt. It does. The travail, the pain. Some, some labors are longer. And, and there's this work, but what happens in a little while, what's going to happen? It's going to be turned to joy. The whole world, the whole world was going to rejoice is what Scripture said. They're happy. Man, this rebel rouser Jesus, he's another prophet gone too far. He claims to be God. And they, and they crucify him. So the world is happy and the disciples are filled with joy. Jesus, Jesus was their friend. He was someone they thought who was going to be the king. They had given up everything to follow after, after the Lord But he's telling them, they're filled with happiness now. You're filled with sorrow. But you are going to, you're going to see your sorrow turn to joy. What was he talking about? He's talking about the resurrection, right? Sorrowful. But the resurrection, you talk about explode and change their life and their perception about everything. It shaped the rest of their lives. It shaped everything about them. Before, they're filled with fear, anxiety, the resurrection, and, and, and the Holy Spirit caused them to be filled with a sense of boldness. Their confidence was in Jesus. Jesus had raised from the dead. He had sent the Spirit. They preached. They proclaimed. No longer living in fear. Recognizing now what Jesus said they were going to experience in the persecution of the church. And do you know that all the disciples except for Judas and John 
were martyrs. They were killed for their faith. Peter was crucified and they got ready to crucify him. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified by, like Jesus. They say he was crucified upside down. John, they tried to kill. They boiled him in oil. He just wouldn't die. So they isolate him on this Isle of Patmos where the Lord gave him the great revelation that we understand, the book of Revelation. Their life was transformed. Listen, I I hope you get this. The resurrection should shape how you and I live as Christ followers. The resurrection should shape how we live our life. We should see everything in light of it. When we do, then we have this confidence that our sorrow turns to joy. Because if the sorrow of the crucifixion can be turned to the joy of the resurrection, then whatever we're facing, whatever we go through life, we have a confidence that just like he was, there there was a day of sorrow, but then the resurrection and, and life, that in a little while, in a little while, we are going to make it through this. Don't give up. You may be or you will go through tough times. You'll be misunderstood. People can be cruel. They can be mean and they can bully. That's what they did to Jesus. It's exactly. That mock court, those religious people bullied Jesus, mocked him, They said things like this, crucify him. These are the same people. These are the same people who were in the the multitude that he fed. He's he's fed these guys. They've, They've followed him around. They've heard his teaching. And now they're filled with hate. They're filled with spite crucify him give us we'd rather have a common criminal give us Barabbas we don't want you things like that happen in our life we go through we go through challenges with people or and with seasons or circumstances of life sometimes sometimes I'm gonna say it this way sometimes we sin And let me just throw this out for what it's worth. The Bible doesn't say when you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. The Bible says if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many people make excuse for sin. Well, you know, I'm human, I just sin. True, given. But but don't make excuse for it and don't make plans for it. If I sin, I have an advocate. Sin can create us being disoriented. Think about what David experienced. And David committed, you know, he committed a doozy. Because it was a premeditated, it wasn't a one time he saw Bathsheba and all of a sudden has some thoughts. It was a planned out, premeditated, here's what I'm going to do. Everybody else went to war. It's a good time for me to be home. Her husband's going to be gone. He was blinded. Sometimes you go through seasons. You may, you may get blinded. It's not an excuse, but you're blinded and you're just hell bent on doing what you want to do. David didn't stop there. He still tried to cover it up and ended up killing her husband, committing murder and lying. And when he was exposed, you talk about, you talk about broken, disordered. Oh, God, have mercy upon me. You read the book of Psalm, his prayer of repentance. See, whether it is because we live in a broken world and people do people things, others or ourselves, live life 
understanding there is sorrow, there is brokenness, there is pain, but we serve a God who is still saying in a little while, just like I rose from the dead, I'm gonna come through in your life because he rose from the dead. Nothing is impossible in our life through him. Amen? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see what Jesus, what Jesus is doing. Let me tell you this. When, when Jesus breaks through, and there's some folks today, you're going through it, but I'm gonna, listen to me. When Jesus breaks through, you're going to be stronger. You will come out. Don't try to make it happen. Listen closely. Don't try to make it happen yourself. Let God fight your battle. You don't fight sinful or worldly methods mindsets by acting like the world. We don't outsmart them, we don't outwit them. We don't try to be meaner or ruder, more rude than they are. <laughs> I'll invent a word or two if you watch me. What happens? No, what do we do? We're gonna keep loving, we're gonna keep forgiving, we're gonna keep smiling, we're gonna keep trusting God, we're gonna take a high road and not a low road, come on, amen. And God is going in a little, we will come through. We will come through and we'll be stronger. And we'll, we will know how God got us through. Amen? Rather than knowing, boy, look what, look what I did. Here's, here's the second thing. And I, man, I got to wind this down. I love that. Joy for sorrow, and here's the second emphasis he gives the disciples, that trouble, trouble will be turned to triumph. Trouble will be turned to triumph. The first part, you know, sorrow to joy, he's dealing with their soul, their mind, their will, their emotions. He's dealing with, with what they're feeling. He wants to impact the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we live out our life. Now, he's teaching them this. He's saying, listen, I want you to get this. Get this into you. You've heard me say a thousand times, if you want to change your life, you got to change the way you think. Remember that, because I want to show you something. Rock my world. I think it's one of the most incredible insights from Scripture that I've ever seen. It has to do with this idea that he turns sorrow to joy, he turns trouble, he'll turn into triumph. Time won't allow me to read through these scriptures. Let me tell you quickly what he's talking about. You know, Christ following is not just being positive, optimistic, or cherry hearted. It's understanding that in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. It, again, it rains on the just and the unjust. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. The foolish man builds his house upon the sand. But the scripture says it rained on both of them. It rained on the man who built his house on the rock, and it rained on the man who built his house upon the sand. We're in a broken world. We face difficulties. They will come. If you're not in one now, you've either been through one and we're getting ready to face complicated, interesting times ahead. In verses 25 through 28, he's again telling the disciple he's going to leave and he's going to come back. In verses 26 and 27, he's talking about how much the Father loves them and how they are going to be able to talk directly to the Father, just like Jesus did, to the Father through Jesus. In verses 29 and 30, the disciples have an opportunity to speak in what seems to be a good statement about their understanding of who Jesus is. And they tell, they tell Jesus that they believe. Apparently, there's something here that we don't see in, in their demeanor because the Lord really sees them as overconfident and he comes back and in a sense rebukes them. 
In verse 32, he says, oh no, guys, you say you believe, but every one of you are going to scatter. He knew that when they came to get him at the garden, they were going to scatter because they thought if they came to get Jesus, they're coming to get us. They're going to crucify him. They're going to end up crucifying us. And we all know about Peter's denial. So Jesus, con- Jesus cautioned them about being overconfident or being filled with pride Spiritual pride. Now, here's the big idea. Here it is. Listen real good. It's just this next minute. Here's what I want you to see. Here's what what emerges, and it's this. Only hope in the strength and power of Jesus. It's only hope in his strength and his power that's going to cause them to not only be sustained, but to overcome. They were not going to overcome in their own strength and power. It's only through Jesus, only by Jesus. This so impacted my mind, and I pray that I can communicate it in such a way that you're able to grasp it. Being a Christ follower should be this. It's about discovering Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus and what he's done. It's about tapping in and trusting his power and not trusting in the arm of our flesh and not trusting in our power. Now listen to this one statement. Here's what, here's, here's what I want you to grab a hold of. I feel like God allowed me to, to find this, to discover this. I know it, but maybe it's just in the way that I see it in light of this message. But here it is. It's that we know more about Jesus that we pursue more of Jesus, that we are growing in Jesus, and that when we do, we become less confident in ourselves. That hit me. What do we, American Christianity, what do we talk about? We talk about how we are going to be successful. Five keys to being successful Five keys to how we overcome. Too many times we declare God's word, I can, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wrong emphasis. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But what do we do? I can do all things. No, it's through Christ. And the more I learn of Jesus, the more I'm surrendered to him, the more I'm dying to self and letting him fill me and be big in me, the more I understand that victory is just all about knowing him and all that he's provided and less about, well, I can have faith plus God and I did this and I do that and I do this. You know, God gives us a sense of self-worth. And God gives us confidence and he gives us boldness. And what do we do? We take it and we make Christianity all about how big and powerful and great we are. And Christianity is not about how big and powerful and great I am. It's about how big and great and powerful and awesome he is. And the bigger I make him, the less I have to trust myself. Why? Well, I made him big. I'm trusting him. So don't try to fix it all. Somebody needs to hear. Don't try to be the one who fixed. Just right now in this little while season, make God big. Make him your pursuit. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. And then, and then he makes this declaration. He says this in verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you got tribulation. People do people things. Broken people, 
broken world, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Do you see the key in this? You see the key? The key is in these, these, little, wor- these little words that in me, in me, in me. It's more of Jesus, more of Jesus, more of Jesus, more of Jesus. Let me give you this, let me give you this thought. Rehearse this. Let me give you some practical steps. Jesus is trying to help the disciples understand this season so they can walk through it. In our life, we have tribulation. We have difficulty. We have, we have struggle. We have disappointment. We get disoriented. Psalm 77 says, Will the Lord spurn forever and never be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Have you wondered, where is God? Are his promises that in the end for all time has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then the next verses, 11 and 12 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember the wonders of old. I will ponder your work. I will meditate in your mighty deeds. Jesus, be big in my heart and in my mind. Rehearse God's word. Rehearse acting acting as the Lord would have you have. In the most difficult of time, God, help me keep loving. God, your promise is true. Pray for those who, who, who persecute you, who would spitefully use you. I bless those. I pray for my enemies. I pray for the situations that, 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 are, that are the world, that it's all about the humanistic side and, and everything that the world is trying to bring. God, I see myself. I'm rehearsing this. You're faithful. Your word endures forever. Rely. Rely. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. What's to humble? Pray, God, I need you. So that in the proper time, hello, in a little while, in the proper time, he will exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Be sober, mindful, watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. People all over go through hard times. Watch this. After you have suffered a little while, the God of grace who has called you to his eternal glory. Grab a hold of this, confess this, pray this. He will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Wow! Why? Because we're trusting, consumed with him. And in a little while, he's gonna restore. Then rest in him. What can we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I often say if God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. And then I I wrote down this reset. We got to reset our minds. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God, let me think. Let me be so connected to the vine. Let me think. Let me live. Let me be consumed with you in mind. You be bigger in my life. Listen, does this make sense to anyone here this morning? Did anybody need to hear this today? Don't give in, give up in a little while. You're gonna get through. Amen. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how the Lord put these things together? I, I marvel at it. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. I will tell you if you're here and you don't know Christ, the answer is in this resurrection. He died on the cross for your sins and he resurrected from the dead. And because he lives, you can have life, you can have abundant life, and you can have eternal life. Amen? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. 
Father, thank you for your word. I, I pray for those who needed to hear, who, who, who this is bringing encouragement. We're going to make Jesus big. We're going to focus on you, and you're going to see us through this. Whatever the darkest of our days might be, Lord, may we, may we realize it's not that I become stronger, I become more confident. It's that you become bigger in my life. And then my confidence flows out of you, my peace, my strength. So I'm not responding in myself, but I'm so filled with you and your spirit. Is there anyone here this morning who say, Pastor, I know I need to surrender my life to Christ today. You just lift your hand. That's me today, Pastor. I need the Lord. I need Jesus. You've never given your life to him, or at one time you did, you know you're not living for him, and you're ready to surrender your life. Hold your hand till I see it and back down. Thank you and thank you. Is there anyone else online? You know you need to give your life to Christ. Stand with me across this room, and, and let's pray. Let's ask the Lord. Let's ask the Lord. Let's all pray with those who lifted their hand, those who are praying online. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me, for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the son of God. Died on the cross and by the power of God rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, nothing is impossible. You can save me, you give me strength, you're my answer. I trust in you. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't believe in easy believism. I believe that there's a biblical pattern and he says if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, we're saved. If you prayed that, I'm going to ask you to text the number that's on the screen, whether it's on your screen at home or here, and text the word next and let us know. We'd love to be in contact with you and talk with you about the commitment that you have made this morning. Liz, you want to join me real quick? And uh, I, want to, I want to share this. Did you catch these words today? We talked about he, he gives joy for our sorrow and he gives triumph for our, our troubled life and difficult times. Did you catch what we sang? He turns mourning to dancing, beauty for ashes. He turns our shame into glory. Graves are turned into gardens, bones into armies, and seas into highways. He's going to turn, he's going to turn your, your situation around. And that's not some trifle, hopeful, just, just positive thinking. I'm telling you, he turns sorrow into joy. He turns our trials and our, our troubles into triumphs. He's the God who suffered and he came alive. And because Jesus lives, we can have hope to believe in a little while he's turning it around for us. Amen? Amen. Can we clap our hands and give God praise this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Can you just say, thank you, Lord. Amen. Come on, folks, let's tap your hands one more time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You're turning it around. Jesus, fill us and consume us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being at the Island Church today. God bless you this morning. I'm so glad you joined us today as we continue our study in the book of John. If you sense God working in your heart, and are contemplating the claims of Christ, or maybe you've prayed with me at the end, we would love to connect with you. Simply text the word NEXT to 
244-2030 and tell us how we can be praying for you. If you're watching for the first time, head to our website, theislandchurch.tv and click connect. You can also submit a prayer request right there on the homepage. And you can also give toward the work of this ministry by clicking give. God is doing a good work here and the Island Church is blessed. Thank you for joining us today. I pray good for you as you seek the Lord and walk with Him. Have an awesome day and the best is yet to come.